moving on to the kind of like the wider risk environment, this applies both to susceptibility and to the downstream vulnerability as well. And these are some of the, the, the kind of issues that are highlighted by different community groups that I was meeting up with. So gender relations, cultural beliefs, stigmatisation, unemployment, migration, poverty. And I'll just say a few words about stigmatisation. I, I mentioned earlier that people are often uh, afraid to go and be tested to find out their HIV status because they're afraid they'll be ostracised or even attacked. Uh, by people in their community, people in their families even. So stigmatisation, uh, if, if people don't know the status, they can't take precautions then to prevent transmission to their partners and, uh, or even to children through mother-to-child transmission. Now, I'd probably say in, in Africa, HIV AIDS is mainly transmitted through uh, heterosexual intercourse but then also through mother-to-child transmission, either in the room, at birth, or through breastfeeding. So that's known as mother-to-child transmission. So uh, gender and cultural beliefs, we'll come back to in a second. Uh, unemployment uh, is a big factor, and that is often in interlinked with migration. And across uh, Southern Africa, particularly Southern Africa, and also in East Africa, an awful lot of people migrate to find work uh, either on large-scale commercial plantation farms or in South Africa, particularly the mines, or they may be just going to cities to try and find work. But that migration is how the, the, kind of like the, the epidemic has become a pandemic and it's moved from kind of clusters along uh, truck routes up and down north and south or east and west across the continent uh, from urban areas into the rural areas. It's through people migrating for work and then returning home to their, their, their rural communities and then infecting partners uh, back at home. So migration has played a huge part in the spread uh, and that's been very much linked into the kind of issues of unemployment. So poverty is now something that we'll kind of spend a few minutes on. And I put this in just to kind of clear up uh, something that goes. Uh, Tavo Mbeki, who was the president of South Africa, uh, before last, the previous former president, he uh, said that AIDS is caused by poverty. Now that was, uh, he was <coughs> kind of denying that HIV was the cause of AIDS. Uh, but poverty is not the cause of AIDS, it's part of the, the broader social context and that fits then into the, this kind of bigger picture of the ecology, if you like, of AIDS. And there's a quote there which uh, I used in the, uh, my little blurb for the brochure for this, this series and I first heard it used by uh, Professor Michael Kelly uh, from uh, University of Zambia. He used that uh, giving a speech here a few years ago and he was saying, uh, Louis Pasteur used the phrase, the terrain is everything. So that's kind of more what I was working on uh, when I was doing my field work. So I was kind of looking at the social context, if you like. And poverty is, is kind of a crucial factor here. But and Becky was incorrect when he said that poverty is the cause of AIDS and then denying HIV was causing it. Okay, so poverty related susceptibility depends on many different things, but particularly these ones lack of access to medical treatment, lack of education, literacy, particularly lack of personal choice. And I'll keep coming back to this, and especially uh, in the case of women and poor living conditions, like people living without access to clean water, to piped water, without uh, kind of modern uh, uh, long drop toilets, those kind of things, uh, and without uh, electricity or anything like that. So these factors kind of all combine to uh, affect people's susceptibility to infection. So this is just kind of describe it a bit more clearly. The chance of someone transmitting HIV is linked to the amount of virus in their body fluids. This is what we call the viral load, which we mentioned earlier on. So, uh, and the chance of somebody becoming infected depends on the weakness of that recipient's immune system. Okay? So there's two different factors going on here. And poverty-related factors that impair uh, the immune system and increase viral loads. So they affect the poverty-related factors affect both people in the encounter. Uh, 
And these factors are malnutrition, different kinds of parasites, and other infectious diseases. Uh, and these also include sexually transmitted infections, and these have a big impact uh, in terms of uh, increasing people's viral load. On the one hand, so the person transmitting the virus, if they have other sexually transmitted diseases, it vastly increases their viral load. But also, for the receiving person, if they have lesions uh, on their genitals related to STIs, then that makes it much more easy for the, uh, the virus to get into their bloodstream, into their system. So, uh, just going over this just one more time again, particularly looking at nutrition. So, someone whose immune system has been weakened by micronutrient deficiencies may be more likely to acquire HIV. That is, they're more at risk of becoming infected. So, micronutrient deficiencies may also increase viral load by enabling HIV to replicate faster or by weakening the person's immune system. So it also makes the transmitting person more infectious to other people. Okay? So I've kind of gone over that several different times, but it's this, this idea that nutrition, if people have these micronutrient deficiencies, they're both more likely to get infected and they're also more likely to pass on the infection. So going back to kind of cultural risk factors, uh, inferior status of women there is one that I've put at the top of the list. And I'll kind of deal with gender-based factors as well, but particularly, uh, and there is a definite cultural dimension to this. And uh, one of the areas where I was doing my fieldwork was uh, in Zimbabwe, where the people have belonged to a kind of Shona ethnic group. And in Shona culture, Women are never considered to reach the age of majority. They're never considered to be legally responsible adults. They're always uh, under the care of either their, their fathers or their husbands, or maybe if they're widows, uh, their sons. And that's, a, that's their cultural tradition. So that kind of might highlight some of the, the kind of like the difficulties. Uh, issues relating to kind of people's beliefs about fertility are also important here. And particularly uh, cultural ideas about becoming a parent often, as, and certainly is true in Botswana, uh, if uh, people aren't really considered to be an adult until they become a parent, and they're known by the name of their first child, uh, with kind of ma or ra, the mother or father is a, a kind of prefix to that. So, and of course, it's, it, it's if people want to have children, it's uh, impossible for them then to use uh, condoms for safer sex. So another idea as well is similar to being a parent is the idea of being an ancestor. If you're not a parent, then you'll never be somebody's ancestor. Uh, sex is also a very big taboo subject. People don't discuss it in the families, not really within relationships either. And uh, another factor that uh, hopefully has really decreased because of awareness raising, but uh, often initiation uh, rites for uh, rites of passage, if you like, for people when they become adolescent, those could often involve uh, kind of cutting lots of different people with the same implement, which might then transmit the virus from through blood uh, from one person to another. So go back to the gender-related risk factors. There's a bunch of less access to education for girl children. Uh, women also tend to be more labour intensive and low income employment and they're also the people responsible for the upkeep of the home such as collecting water, uh, collecting firewood. 80% of agriculture in Africa is actually done by women growing food for the families rather than the, the men that be involved in producing cash crops for example. But generally it's the women that are the ones responsible for producing the food crops for the family. Uh, I, can, I mentioned kind of customary uh, traditions earlier on, and particularly uh, laws regarding inheritance and uh, entitlement to ownership of assets are a big thing. Often, uh, widows don't have any kind of claim on the, the kind of like the, the family property is considered to be the husband's, and then his brothers would then come along and kind of lay claim to any assets or property or anything like that, and the widow 
wouldn't have any stake in that. She'd end up more often than not having to move back to her family, her clan. And actually, that, that idea of family and clan is a lot to do with the to do with the education issues because uh, girl children, when they when they're growing up, they their kind of family think, well, you know, they're, they're going to grow up, they're going to get married, and then they're going to move to somebody else's clan. They're no longer going to be in our clan. They're going to be in somebody else's clan. So uh, in terms of prioritising uh, education, it tends to be boys that, that are given the priority. So anyway, these factors all add up to women's economic dependence on men. And that then leads to a lack of uh, sexual and reproductive autonomy. For example, women are very, very uh, unlikely to be able to discuss the use of condoms in a in a relationship, in a marriage, or anything. Uh, they, you know, from from the accounts I've heard, they would probably be then be suspected of being uh, uh, kind of in an affair or something like that with other people. They they would be uh, chances are they'd be thrown out of the family home and sent back to, but their their folks in disgrace. So. The next slide is uh, it's going to play a, an audio clip which comes from uh, Zimbabwe, it's from my field recordings and uh, the quality isn't very good at all, I'm afraid it wasn't done for kind of broadcast, it was just done for transcription, so there's an awful lot of kind of background to them, but hopefully you'll be able to hear them and uh, it'll give me a chance to have a sip of water. Women are supposed to put themselves to be submissive to be a husband. They're not supposed to say anything. So if it comes to anything like family planning, it's the men who is the, the final say. Even this HIV AIDS, um, even if women try to say no to like sex without a condom, it will be a problem. Such that they might, at the end of the day, they might be chased away and sent back to their parents' homes. So most people, they, they think that it's a disgrace being seen to pick your parents on. They just succumb to their husband's needs and at the expense of their bodies and their immune system. So it's actually a problem. So trying to, trying to teach the woman to, like, trying to highlight her rights. Yeah. Uh, well, the society is not yet accepting that. Because in the rural areas, wow. I do. People still have that strong cultural background, like whatever the men says, that is to go. So here in the rural areas, things are a bit tight because the women are not educated and they, are, they don't know their rights whatsoever. And it's going to take a long while for them to realize that their, their rights. The point goes back to the literacy, the level of literacy. So women need to be more educated. That's how I see it in rural areas, because most of them didn't go to primary. 13 years getting married, 14 years getting married, that's it. Mm -hmm. And talking to them, you can actually see that they're getting married is actually their dream. Because in some, their society they grew up in, mm -hmm. girls not going to school, boys going to school. So another aspect of this is what's been called the sugar daddy syndrome, which is about intergenerational transmission of the virus from older men to younger women. And uh, this is kind of responsible for uh, prevalence rates, which is uh, kind of like the percentage of the cohort. Uh, prevalence rates of women between 15 to 24 years of age are in most of Saharan Africa, well, certainly eastern and southern African countries, uh, usually two to three times higher than they are for men of the same age. In the, the kind of UN AIDS documents, uh, they say up to eight times, but looking at the statistics for places like Zimbabwe, Botswana, uh, South Africa, it's usually two to three times higher than the, the boys and young men in the same age cohort. And then later on, the women will, they'll, they might be first become sexually active with older men, but then they'll, later on as they get older and beyond 20, they'll start to have relations with boys their own age. So that's a big aspect of this kind of 
how the, the virus has been uh, transmitted down through different age groups. So that's a fairly complicated diagram that I put together just to kind of demonstrate uh, some of the different links. I don't know if it's legible or not uh, to those at the back. At the top, there's poverty there. At the bottom here, increased less risk of HIV infection and then age-related sickness and death. The, the colours on the slides don't represent anything, but some of the different links. I mentioned migration earlier on. As it say, poverty can cause people to migrate. Uh, can, that can lead to people having multiple sexual partners. Quite often, if people are working a lot uh, in, a, in a different city, different uh, mining area, different plantation, they might have a completely new second family in their place of work, as well as their original partners and children in their, uh, their rural community. So migration and the, the fact that people are away from the kind of social uh, moors of their, their village, they, uh, you know, getting away from all that kind of thing leads often to uh, people having multiple partners and uh, becoming more at risk of infection. This generation is being wiped out by HIV AIDS. The stress and the poverty. Poverty is also a catalyst. It spreads and it helps catalyze the spread of AIDS, the prevalence of AIDS. It's catalyzed by poverty. HIV AIDS is a problem to everyone. Everyone is vulnerable to the They don't have the number of assets that they can sell and manage to pay for the hospital bills. So they say that if someone gets affected with HIV AIDS, so which means every member of the family has got a role to play in caring for that member. And that's decreasing the workloads on the farm. So decreasing the workload means decreasing the production. And even the, any income they get, they are pumping into the hospital bills and everything. So that's costing the family. So everyone is being troubled by HIV. So everyone is vulnerable. Looking over at this side of the diagram where the allies point upwards and come back, this is the kind of downstream effect, the vulnerability to the impact of members of the family becoming infected and getting sick uh, and eventually dying. So you have increased dependency burden, which is greater numbers of uh, sick people, children and older people compared to the active uh, people within the household. And that's a key thing about HIV AIDS is that the people that it affects are the sexually active group within the population, the people between 15 and 50, for example. But these are the people who are the, the breadwinners, the income-generating people. Other uh, illnesses tend to target the, the kind of the younger people, the children, or the elderly, whereas HIV AIDS is targeting the people in this middle generation who are the ones that usually look after the children and look after the elderly people. And then also there's uh, resources that are being diverted into uh, care and into paying for funerals. So uh, we'll kind of uh, just go through a list now of these kind of different impacts. Loss of adult labour lead leading to labour shortages. Decline in household incomes because there's a loss of labour then uh, there's less money coming in, but at the same time, there's more money going out, there's more expenditures, and then you get this increase in dependency burden. Uh, 